Morning again. Uh, good morning officially. Uh, my name is Kevin Light. I work on the team at Leading with Honor with Lee Ellis, and we have a fantastic topic for you today with a couple of guests who have been so gracious to share their time and expertise with us today. The title, The Quandary of Leadership, What to Do When Your Best Talents Aren't Enough. This is a guest panel webinar event with guests Rail and Kovic and General Robin Rand. Um, just wanted to say hello, welcome, glad you're here. Our, our host today though, uh, if you're new with us, either DNA Behavior or Leading with Honor, our guests, our host today are Lee Ellis. He's a leadership coach, author, and certified speaking professional former colonel in the Air Force and the former Vietnam POW. And Hugh Massey is the CEO of DNA Behavior International. And so we are, uh, we love these two gentlemen and the, the, their passion for teaching leaders and teaching others how to use the idea of human behavior to lead better and lead well. And so with that, uh, we're going to, uh, I'm going to hand this over to Lee and Hugh to kick off today's event. Just a reminder to that, to engage and participate today. Uh, use the Q&A button on your Zoom panel to ask any questions during the event. And we'll try to ask, answer those either during the event or at the end of the event. So use that Q&A button in your Zoom panel. Uh, we're also gonna feature some optional polls that you can answer as well anonymously. And so pay attention to those polls when they come up and we'd love to hear your feedback on them as we talk and have this conversation together with our guests. So uh, with that, I'm gonna hand this over to Lee and Hugh. Uh, again, so glad to have these guests with us. Uh, Hugh, if you'll just kind of set up the topic that we're talking about today in the title, why we've called it the Quandary of Leadership and then Lee, if you'll introduce our guests. Thank you, Kevin. Well, I'm delighted to, to be with everyone today to talk about the quandary of, of leadership. And we're going to be very much focused on uh, talents and, um, you know, why they're not enough when you become a leader. And I was sitting here before the call reflecting on my early days as a leader, and I became a leader fairly early on in my career, I got my first leadership role at, at age 25. And, and that was really because I was very goal driven. I got everything done on time, extremely reliable. My bosses liked working with me. Um, <clears throat> I achieved all the targets. And, you know, as, as, as one of my uh, peers said, you know, I was, I was also quite pushy. But that got me to that got me to the leadership position because others above me thought they could rely on me. But when I got to the leadership role, the struggle started to come out because I had to now manage people. And I had 10 people that I had to manage and get tasks done. And, you know, being the leader, I had to motivate them, uh, inspire them to, to come and do their best. I had to be approachable. Uh, I had to be patient. And while I, as much as loved teaching people, and, 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 and sort of knew instinctively or intuitively that I had to bring them along, my style didn't always do that. And I was just looking for the results out of them and a little bit treated each one as a number. And if they didn't get their task done on time, they were uh, relegated to the B or the C team, never to be seen again. And, and ultimately that wasn't good enough. And I found that, uh, my first performance review as a leader wasn't too good. And that was the first time I got a kick in the pants as a, as a leader. So really what was going on there was I was using my talents as a results-based uh, person that I had used to get into the leadership role, but I wasn't uh, managing the, the flip side of those talents. In other words, I was overusing my strengths, my results-based strengths uh, and not being very relational. And what I learned from there on, and of course I've learned with Lee as my mentor, and I was talking about this with Ray Ellen at the start, you've got to balance results and, and relationships at every stage of your journey, every situation that you're in, all the way along, uh, if you're going to be a successful leader. And that's been uh, my learning lesson. I'm still learning it today uh, because I'm a human and we all are faced with different situations and different pressure cooker uh, situations at, at, at any time. So we're going to we're sort of going to dive into that a, a lot today with um, uh, General Rand and, and, and Ray Alankovich, who, who Lee will introduce in a minute uh, 
you know, to, to really see how uh, talents aren't enough and that you have to uh, balance out your results and relationship side, depending on which is dominant for you. What I, what I want to do is leave you with a quote from, from Churchill that is very uh, poignant in this. And this came from his biography uh, written by Piers Brendan. And it says, Churchill rose to this challenge with incomparable vigor and self-confidence. These characteristics were precisely the ones to which he owed both his failures and his successes as first Lord. So that's when he was in his younger days. For as Admiral Bacon said, Churchill's vices were simply his virtues in exaggerated form. Dash became rashness, assurance became cocksureness. Churchill's overflowing energy was difficult to harness. His overwhelming faith in himself closed his mind to the opinions of others. And so that really plays into the point that I was making that your strengths, uh, while they might get you to a certain place, if overplayed, become a struggle. If you don't pay attention to them, they become a weakness. And that's what we will dwell in today in the quandary of leadership. So over to you, Lee, to, uh, to take Thank us you. Thank you, Hugh. You know, uh, I learned in Air Force ROTC that leaders had to do three things. One, to have character and integrity. Two, they had to accomplish the mission. And three, they had to take care of the people. And believe it or not, in the military, mission and people is still, and character first, mission and people is still the struggle that we all have. Now, this item, this subject that we're talking about today is so critical that Ray Allen and I basically make a living coaching leaders and helping leadership teams get a handle around this and gain the self-awareness so they can balance mission and people, relationship and results. Because it comes down to it, uh, it's the, the biggest challenge for every person who wants to grow as a leader. Well, speaking of people who've grown as a leader, uh, General Robin Rand and I go back about uh, eight years now. When I met him, he was uh, commander of 12th Air Force out in Tucson, Arizona. And as I got to know him and have watched him, uh, he's the most amazing leader I've ever seen because he can adapt to whatever it takes. He's going to have that situational awareness, the self-awareness, and then able to manage the situation and manage himself to be a great leader. And you know, as a four-star general, there are not many four-star generals. He's worked his way all the way up, but I was at his retirement. Two hours and 38 minutes with one person after another coming up on the stage at the Air Force Academy, a thousand people in the audience in Arnold Hall there, but one after the other, these were widows from war, the war, sergeants, other generals, classmates came up and sang the praises of this man and told how wonderful he had been to them and what a great job he had been as a friend, as a leader, as a boss. And he had made so much of an impact on so many people. I walked out of that audience after two hours and 38 minutes, we finally got a break. <laughs> and I said, I've never seen anything like that. This man who's obviously commanded Global Strike Command, which is the old Strategic Air Command, uh, Air Education Training Command, and then uh, the tactical fighter pilot in the F-16 and commander of the Weapons Center out at Nellis Air Force Base. How did he do all that? How did he do it? So we're honored to have you with us, General Rand. And so I want to start out by asking you how you got started in, in leadership and what was, did you have any good or bad experiences that really influenced you early on? Well, thank you, Lee. Uh, first, I do want to thank you for this opportunity, you and Hugh. Thanks a lot. I appreciate it. Um, you, you have had a profound impact on, on my life. Um, and certainly, uh, I took the time later in my life to read your wonderful book, Lee with Honor, and it really opened my eyes. And, and I, they said, don't make an endorsement. But I have shared that book with literally hundreds of up and coming leaders, because it's such a a phenomenal story. You tell a story, but then you pull out what, what are the lessons there? How can we persevere through our tough times? Uh, I would just tell you that um, there's two ways to learn. Um, one of them is through hard knocks. You learn through life experiences. And certainly as a leader, I've learned a lot of, of lessons through my failures and shortcomings. There's probably a more efficient way to learn, and that is through the transfer of knowledge. 
And that is what we're doing today. I think sharing lessons and experiences. And I commend all the people that are on today because uh, you desire to be a better leader. And I think that's fundamentally important. I, I basically believe that uh, leadership can be taught. There are people who are inclined to have natural skills that make them disposed to be, a, in some cases, good leaders. They can communicate their looks, their athletic abilities, but the bottom line is leadership can be taught. And if you don't believe that, we're probably spinning our wheels, okay? So leadership can be taught. And, and I, I, I really, really encourage uh, the type of engagements like this. I wish I had engaged in these things much earlier in my life. I, I really, really do. So to your question, Lee, um, I was very blessed early on. And maybe I was a little self-absorbed too. So I didn't pay attention a lot what was going on around me. I was a pilot. I concentrated on that. But when I look back, most of my leaders were all Vietnam veterans like yourself who had been combat tested. And they were tough and rough and they focused on the mission. But I look back, they all really had a deep desire to do the right thing by the people that served with them. So I really didn't meet a really bad leader that I can recall early. And so to be honest with you, to answer your question, that first leader I met that had shortcomings was myself. And I vividly remember when I was a captain. I had been in the Air Force about eight years and I was serving with the Army as an air liaison, air liaison officer in Germany. Not terribly happy with my lot in life. It wasn't flying, I was away from that. And, but I had about 15 to 20 young airmen and a few soldiers that directly worked for me. And I was way too focused on what they thought of me and not nearly enough on the mission. And I was a terrible enabler. I enabled their bad behavior. I needed to be probably tougher and firmer. And consequently, they were able to kind of pull the wool over my eyes. And I realized that early in my career that you really do have to be balanced between mission and that people aspect. So that was an enlightening experience for me. So I'll stop there. Well, that's a great story. And uh, I will just share this publicly that when we did the leadership behavior DNA assessment with your team out of the Gary Sinise Foundation, you came out as being very relational very relationship oriented, which kind of went with what I saw in the Air Force Academy retirement ceremony. But I also had seen you certainly be tough and you knew how to be that. And now you're sharing with us that you started to learn that, uh, you know, somewhere in your late twenties of all approaching 30 years old, that through experience you learned that and you had learned, you had to be tougher at times and toughen up. That's right. Oh, That's exactly right. So let me just say that 40% of the population is born more relational, those talents for relationship to be the good friend kind of guy, and 40% are born more results, mission focused, and a little bit more like uh, Hugh and I were talking about earlier today. And our next guest is going to talk about what that was like to be born more results oriented. So Ray Ellen Kovitz coming in. Ray Ellen and I have worked together for maybe eight years now. Uh, I met her 15 or more years ago when she was uh, on the executive team at uh, a company here in Atlanta. And she's been out and now is a certified coach and a wonderful coach. And I brought her in to coach two CEOs. So she knows this business well, but she's a very results oriented person by her natural talents. She's pretty much an opposite to you, General Rand. So Ray Ellen, come on in and tell us uh, a little bit about your story and what you learned early on. Great. Thank you so much, Lee and Hugh, for inviting me to be here. And uh, like General Rand, I want to thank you for the opportunity and share that, Lee, you have been a, uh, a great leadership mentor to me, colleague and friend. Um, and I have learned so much from you and grown over the years. Uh, I would say that my one of my initial experiences with leadership early on in my career was probably very opposite to General Rand's in the respect that I worked for um, uh, in the think tank in Washington, DC. I actually worked for a former uh, army brigadier general who really exhibited the true command and control uh, side of results leadership. And in fact, unfortunately, probably viewed 
people more as uh, I would say tools or instruments to achieve results and really where connection just was not a priority. Um, and so unfortunately, I probably related a bit to that and sort of went behind that and said, let's go and let's achieve the mission. And, and the result out of that for me was I learned that failure was not an option. And I learned that this was all focused on achieving results and achieving uh, whatever was necessary. And, and we'll just knock down whatever's in front of us in order to make sure that we achieve that mission. Uh, but the balance to that was the leader of the organization at the time was completely opposite to that and was very much a renowned leader who connected with people and cared about people and made sure that he knew everyone's name um, and certainly even went further to thank everyone for efforts, something that I was not exposed to with my immediate uh, boss who was so command and control. And, and I think at the time, um, I probably early in my career didn't necessarily have the language to really understand the differences between those two leaders and the command and control versus a little bit more relational. Um, but certainly I think filed that away and knew that the importance of what now I utilize with leaders that I work with is, is really understanding emotional intelligence and understanding how we're showing up and the impact of our behaviors and the impact of that um, on others is so hugely important. Um, but I learned from that control, command and control leader that I didn't necessarily enjoy working for that type of a person. And so my biggest takeaway was while I could relate to a lot of that, um, it would present a struggle for me later on. And it was probably quite some time later where I had to learn how to adapt to that. But we can get into some more of that. Hey, hey Lee, can I, can I say something? Yes, sir. Along those lines, and Ray Allen, thank you for that uh, story. What I hope the big takeaway, though, is it shouldn't be a dilemma. You can be both. For sure. You can be mission focused and people oriented. And that's the takeaway. And I'm with you, Leah. My mantra in the Air Force my last 15, 20 years was mission, airmen, families. It's not a contrast. You know, you can be both. And to, to Ray Allen's point, what people want is they want to know they matter. They want to know what they're doing is important to part of something bigger than themselves. And that's where a leader has to come in. You've got to find a way to be able to connect those dots with your folks. And, and that's, that's the, the big key. Uh, I think, you know, we don't have to be one or the other, but you have to be balanced. And I'll just share it now. What I've learned through doing things like the LBDNA, which I'm so grateful I did, is you learn about your natural traits, who you are really deep down. But what I've learned from that is that you have to be as a leader to be effective. You have to be less of who you are and more of who you aren't when you're dealing with your people. You have to be vulnerable and you have to try to be less of who you are mm. and more of what you are. And I think if you concentrate on that, you can be both mission oriented and people focused. Thank you. That is uh, powerful to hear that. And I remember that statement you made there last December the 19th about the one you just made about less of who you are and more of who you aren't. And I'd never heard it spoken quite like that. And it was exactly the kind of thing we actually try to teach in our coaching of, uh, of leaders. You know, I think about some of the clients that I've had who were wonderful people, but they were just focused on who they were and uh, some task oriented people that I actually gave them a task of getting to know their people. I gave them a spreadsheet with their people's names across the top and what they needed to get to know about them and be able to affirm them down the left side and they had to actually check it off. So we used their results uh, task focus to actually help them grow and their, act their way into a new way of feeling. Hugh, what's your thoughts on this and as we go forward here? Oh, I, I agree with uh, what 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 General Rand said, I, 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 I was reflecting on it in a way when I know nowadays people, when they see my profile, they're actually surprised by it because they don't realize um, quite how extreme it is, you know, on the on the results side, because I've learned to uh, step more into the relationship side of, of the world when I when I have to and and all the hard-edged results um, uh, 
components of my of my style don't always show up in in every setting because I've I've learned to to adapt it you know and that's through through luckily working with you you a lot Lee um, and and you know and having that having the rough edges knocked off um, but but I also know that there are days when it, that 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 hard edge profile needs to um, style needs to needs to show up as well and I think that you know what we're talking about here is really um, is managing is managing that balance um, all, all the time and knowing the settings when to adapt, not to adapt. Um, but at the same time, as a leader, I think sometimes you've got to be the you've got to be the person out front, and sometimes that means having the courage to make the tough decision. But with your team, you've got to be nurturing uh, them and bringing them along and making them feel comfortable, even though you're taking the hits. Um, and th and that's not always easy. No, exactly. Um, you know, one of the things that that I find myself sometimes in situations is procrastinating on doing one of those things that's not so easy uh, for me to do. So I just thought maybe we'll start back with Ray Ellen, come back around to General Rand. Is you ever <laughs> can you recall in your growing as a leader when you found yourself procrastinating on something that you probably should have been doing just because it wasn't your natural thing and it was you were kind of holding off. <laughs> Uh, that's a great question. Well, you know, I'm a big believer that um, that self-awareness piece is a journey um, mm -hmm. and something that we enter into almost daily. But, you know, it probably was more of a, a wake-up call that showed up for me in a couple of ways. You know, as a results-oriented person, similar to, to Hugh, you know, I kept getting um, phenomenal uh, feedback and, and had leaders who, you know, great job on performance reviews, you know, exceeds expectations on the results. I call it the what, you know, what I achieved was always excellent, but the how I achieved that was where some of that struggle would show up. And, and as a results oriented person, my natural um, style is to be somewhat more introverted. And so the how, the way that feedback would show up for me would be to, you know, you need to, you know, really uh, talk to people more or interact with people more. And as a young introverted results driven person, I heard that as you need to be more extroverted, which now I understand is probably not what the intent was. Um, but of course, I shied away from that because extroversion was not a natural, natural side or a natural talent for me. And so I guess that's the, a big piece of that procrastination. You know, I can think back to um, when my company relocated me to Atlanta and it was a Monday morning and I was leading um, a, a team, team meeting around the table and I had a jam packed agenda and very focused and we only had a short amount of time and we had a lot to get through and so launched right in into that agenda and had a very successful meeting and thought, this is great. Went back to my office and no worries. And I had an executive colleague come by and share a piece of feedback and said, you know, I, I understand that you just recently moved to Atlanta, but something you need to be aware of is down here in the South, we actually take time to say, good morning. How was your weekend on a Monday? And, and I thought that was really interesting. Um, certainly at the time, I didn't necessarily need to relate to people to me, right? Just have people talk to me about my weekend. It was fine to jump into the agenda. Um, but to learn to say, you know, that's important. People need that connection. And that is just as much a vital piece of the agenda to connect and relate to others and set the tone for that meeting as it was to, to jump in. So it took me some time to get more comfortable uh, to step into that relational side and recognize that it wasn't necessarily about being super ex extroverted, um, but rather it was to show that I cared and that people mattered and that I wanted to step in to, to make that connection because underneath that what was always perceived as a very tough exterior um, was a very warm heart that genuinely always did care for people. And so the procrastination was to recognize uh, that I needed to make sure that the present inside the wrap, wrapping paper actually matched and that to, to step into that and show that connection and show the care first um, allowed people to then listen and hear what was necessary to move forward on, on the agenda and the achievement of the results. Great explanation, and thank you for sharing that. General Rand, do you have any comment? Uh, you're on mute. You're on mute. 
The short answer is yes, <laughs> I've procrastinated. Um, let me give you some feedback on that or background. I've never procrastinated on mission issues. When there's been shortfalls and problems and challenges with the mission, very easy for me to, to charge forward. On people-related issues, because of that natural instinct, I have. And I procrastinate. And what I realize is that a problem is not like good wine. It doesn't age with time. It doesn't go away. And I have, at most levels of command, to include the current job I'm in, I have been slow to pull the trigger probably past the point of when I should. I would tell you, though, temper that. Thoughtful, deliberate is important as a leader, but sometimes avoiding the problem <laughs> isn't going to make it go away. So yes, I have. And here's what I learned from that. The danger in doing that, the real danger, is one, your subordinates will lose confidence in you because they'll see that you're, 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 you're not owning your responsibility. But more importantly, or equally important, is you're going to make your boss do your job for you. Mm. And you never want to do that. Right. You never want to have your boss. And where I learned that was as a young Lieutenant Colonel Squire and Commander, had about 300 people in my command. I had a personnel issue. It was a sensitive one. It was a hard decision. And my 06 Colonel boss told me, dude, you better do the right thing here. If you don't, I will. And if you don't, there will be repercussions for you not doing your job. And I go, wow, don't make your boss do my job. Wow, that is great. Thank you. You guys have really shared some wonderful insights today that, uh, that really capture so much of what we're talking about here today. Uh, that that self-awareness and that being able to learn to adapt away from our natural behavior or not away from it, but into our unnatural behavior to do the appropriate thing for the situation for the good of all. We're not hurting anybody when we hold people accountable. We're actually helping everybody. I fired a guy who was a flight commander when I was a squadron commander. I fired a guy who was a good friend of mine. My wife and his wife were good friends, but I had to fire him. And, uh, and I told him, I said, look, this is not this is not all your fault. Part of it is my re my responsibility. That's not the right job for you. Your talents are not being a flight commander. You're more of a staff guy. And I made him a staff guy and he did great. But I said, it's not going to work for either one of us if you stay here. <laughs> so, you know, having the uh, the wisdom and I think both of y'all have indicated that the need to think it through and make sure you're making a wise decision, which regardless of which way you're going tough, going toward the sick or toward the carrot and being able to engage with people and to share with them and show you're caring. Either way, it does need to be wisely done. And so having some thought into it. Thank you, Hugh. Comment. Well, I, think, I think, Lee, you can, um, you know, it, 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 this is an interesting discussion because I think for me as a result, straight person, the natural instinct is to make quick decisions. Um, but, you know, and I don't like procrastination when I know when I know the decisions got to be made. But I've also learned that time tells you a lot of things and that not every decision, even some of the big ones have to be made on the spot and, and that they're, uh, you can slow the process down, get a little bit more information and, and, and work out what is a compassionate uh, way to at least deliver the message. Um, or, 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 or to, uh, you know, make the situation better and, and get a win for everybody. It doesn't always have to be harsh. And I think that's the, the problem is that when we, when we just race in there and make the tough decision too quickly and deliver it in a harsh way, that's when there's really uh, blood on the street um, following it and, um, you know, wounded bodies everywhere, where, where I don't think that needs to happen every time. I think we can make tough decisions but also be compassionate with it. And yeah. I think that's that that and that's particularly important right now in the COVID situation. We're going to have a lot more of that next year, I think. Um, and I think that's important for us as leaders to to recognize. But but yeah. I also I've just been learning that time can can help and being compassionate in the way you deliver the message and handle the situation is important. 
And, and even, um, Hugh, you know, to be inclusive, I think it's important, particularly yeah. in today's day and age, that leaders understand um, the need to be inclusive. And, and yep. if we rush so much to a decision on our own as the leader, because we're so focused on the results, we might uh, miss some great input if we uh, are remiss in including some of the thought leadership from our team and those around us. And I think the, the results driven leaders um, who have learned to value the import the in, uh, input of their team and to seek out the inclusiveness of their team in that decision making process are the leaders that really have, have shown um, that they've achieved even further. And you can do that quickly. I think sometimes a challenge as a results driven person, we think, oh, the speed is up the essence. And if I reach out and try to include everyone else, it'll slow down the process. And I think the more leaders that have opened themselves up and um, to vulnerability and have built some of the trust um, are the ones who actually can achieve further, faster. Um, yeah. and, and absolutely, I, I think inclusivity right now is so important for that results-driven leader uh, to recognize. Yeah, exactly. I couldn't agree more. I want to move to a poll question here in just a minute. But last month, I uh, in November, my blog was on loose tight, and the tight part is focusing, getting, using your talents to get things done. But the loose part is backing up and asking questions, and then just listening, and uh, you know, showing respect for people by listening to their ideas and opinions. Because quite often, they know something you don't know, and you need to know it in order to make a good decision. So valuing your people. Uh, and their input is gonna be very important. Kevin, I think you've got a poll question for us. Why don't you jump in and introduce that? It, it does. This question, this poll question is related to the topic that you're discussing right now. And so what we're asking, and this is your anonymous answer, so please be honest uh, about this question. You're gonna, it's gonna show up now. And the question is, how would you rate your level of behavioral self-awareness uh, from a Likert scale of excellent to very poor? and uh, everything in between, if you're honest with yourself, how would you rate your level of behavioral self-awareness now as a leader or as a colleague or a mother or father for that matter? So uh, we're rating, uh, we're getting the results in now. Uh, people are responding. Uh, good. Uh, thank you for responding. All right. Um, and so let's share those results. Uh, the results are above average. So 66% uh, of those that uh, share their results are saying above average, which is which is really good. And it's expected for this uh, adept audience that we've talked about today, our, our friends and colleagues that we have on here right now. So, so yeah. yeah so, so many of the, the folks who uh, come to our webinars or kind of followers of DNA behavior or leading with honor. And so they are actually taking their skills at a, to a higher level by listening to some of these great leaders uh, share from their experience. And I know that you all will be going back and the people in the audience will be sharing uh, more of what you've heard today with the people around you. And we really appreciate that. Well, moving ahead a little bit uh, as, we're, as our time moves forward, I want to to think a little bit about helping others grow. We've talked about the things of what we've learned about our own self-awareness and how we've had to grow beyond procrastination and how a lot of this adapting, as General Rand was talking about, doing more of what you're not so natural at. Uh, all of that adapting is gonna continue the rest of our lives. It'll become a little bit easier. We'll know, we'll have more confidence in it, but we're gonna be working at that forever. It's just part of life and who we are. But uh, thinking about how we help others develop and grow. So I'd like to hear any uh, experience you've had, a good experience, it could have been one-on-one -on -one, or could have been with a larger group or some insight that you've learned about helping uh, be people become more self-aware because that's really the key to this. Uh, you can't manage what you don't know. The old thing about uh, the, the carpenter who only has a hammer uh, to the carpenter who only has a hammer, everything looks like a nail, but uh, we're making people aware more and more now that they have more than a hammer and they can use more than a hammer, but that self-awareness, how do you help people become more self-aware? So General Rand, you will have some insights on that? Surely, um, the, the way that I have ex learned about self-awareness is one, there is a very strong transition period. And this is where I really think I made a big leap Earlier in my career, I was serving for me. What's in it for me? 
And then the realization somewhere along the line became service is bigger than me and what, clarity on why I was serving and understanding that was the mission and understanding that it was to lead and support and help the people that were doing the mission and to help and support the families who are supporting the people who are doing the mission. And once I s figured that out, then I realized I need to be better, that I need to get the tools to be a more effective leader and wingman, if you will. And to do that, then you have to become a student. To be self-aware, you have to become a student. And I think it's, it's events like this. It's reading your books. It's taking the LBDNA. It's doing the Meyer Briggs. It's observing and analyzing. And then it's taking time whether it's, it's daily or a couple times a week to really reflect on what are your strengths? What are your shortfalls? What did you do right? What would you do differently in the seek counsel? And, and you gotta be willing, if you wanna be self-aware, you gotta be willing to go into the receive mode. I think someone said that, maybe it's Ray Allen, and listen, and you gotta give people an opportunity. Don't be one way. I'm not a good listener. And I need to be a better listener and I need to seek feedback. What am I doing well? Where can I improve? And I think uh, understanding what are good traits. So there has to be a basis. Again, what are just good traits? Doesn't matter about your personality. What do people want out of a leader? And, and understand what those traits are. And you, know, you don't need 500 of them. Have four or five traits that you want to concentrate on so that you can be effective and then work at it and do the things we talk. That's where self-awareness comes and where it's important. Why I think it becomes important to do that is as you move up the food chain, if you're not self-aware, not many people are going to give you feedback. Mm -hmm. You got to be your own worst critic to be, or harshest critic, to be honest. So I'll, I'll stop there. I don't know if that was valuable or not. Very, very helpful, very helpful. Uh, Ray Ellen, your comment. Sure. Uh, just to, to build on that of, of General Rand's comments, you know, in my work today as an executive leadership coach, and I'm also a team coach. And so I do work with leaders and their teams to drive overall team performance. And a big piece of that, of course, is the self-awareness, but where I find so much of uh, my work is the practicality of how does that really show up? And, um, and we can take these, uh, you know, the, you know, one of the, the key pieces of my methodology when I do my coaching work is first and foremost is know yourself. If you don't know yourself and know your strengths and your struggles and those traits and how you show up, uh, you certainly can't move forward. Uh, but where the rubber meets the road is what are we doing about that? And how are we putting some of those things into action? And so, you know, one of the, one of the questions I will ask teams is, 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 you know, what do you need to see here and feel to know that these things are working? or that um, the struggles are going away or that we're leveraging our strengths and how does that really show up from the practical behavior side of things and, and how does that impact the results that we're trying to achieve. Um, a, a great um, exercise that I, that I use with leaders and teams um, relates to emotional intelligence and certainly for those results driven leaders who are all about um, like I was don't really want to take the time to make that connection or, or really take the time to, to meet Meet with people um, because we're so focused on the results. But you know, first and foremost, when you think about the best leader or the, the greatest leader that you've had, you know, describe that person. And more often than not, when teams um, give those descriptors, they're all relational type uh, orientation. Of course, they like a leader who has vision and they, they want to follow, but they think about, you know, they valued me or they made me feel good or they, you know, they always said hello to me, you know, those types of things. And the impact of that behavior from a leader, um, what did, how did that make you feel? And, and that, that second column of how you felt with that leader um, was about building trust. Um, and the impact of when you felt that way, because that leader's behavior showed up the way they did, what did that cause you to do? And that third column is all about the results. 
And the leader who um, perhaps doesn't recognize and take action with that self-awareness, that's where they fail is in that results column. Um, and in, more often than not, that's what we're all after as leaders is about those results. So I do a lot of work with leaders, helping them not only have that self-awareness, uh, but take that self-awareness into that next step and understand the impact of that. Um, yep. If you're if you're hugely results oriented, sometimes the intensity shows up so huge in such like a wave uh, that that really you just annihilate people and people are struggling, even though they want to achieve those results for you. They're not really sure how to go about doing that. Um, so certainly moving people through the self-awareness piece into the behavioral impact so that they can make some of that change and ultimately achieve some of the results that they are really there to do. Good, good, thank you. Hugh, do you have a comment? Yeah, I, I, what I'd like to add um, to, to what General Rand said and what uh, Ray Ellen said is, I think people have to put themselves in the place of actually being coachable. Um, and that means being open to feedback and you've got to be vulnerable uh, out there to, to, to take it, to receive the feedback. You know, I, I've had to learn, you know, um, myself with, uh, you know, all through my career that, but Lee has also taught me that, that I have to, you know, be, be open and willing to, to accept the feedback, which means being vulnerable. And normally that I think is uh, also being prepared to share something of who you are and that you might have a struggle with something uh, and that you need help. And that, that, that not everything, even if you are a great leader or a very successful person is always working all the time and being, uh, and being prepared to share that's important. But I, I think there's also another part that I, I've learned in, in the past year or so, and that is you've got to have the motivation. Uh, so you've got to have the motivation to, to want to change and to want to develop. So we can talk about self-awareness um, till the cows come home, but also you've got to have the motivation to want to develop. And, and, and where I've, you know, what I've found is, is good for people to think about is what is their identity? How, how are you going to show up? How are you going to be seen? And there's a great book by Bill Wersma on this, The Power of Identity. And uh, I think that when you, when you see for yourself who you want to be and who you aspire to be, that will motivate you to make those changes that you need to make. Then you will move from self-awareness to highly evolved because you want to be that, that person who's operating at that higher level. And that's how, that's how you're going to show up in the world. And so I think that's also part of it is so, you know, when I've been working with people now, we, we talk a lot about talent, but identity is important uh, to, to getting that change, of course, your purpose, and then, and then being able to live a life of significance and put yourself in that place. And, yep. and, and that'll bring along the changes. Yep. I know John Rand's got something to say about that. Well, no, I agreed with uh, what you said, totally. I, I was chuckling, I did a, the forward for Bill's second book. So uh, he, he, he really captures a lot of the things yep. that you yep. mentioned. Um, so it's, I, the second, I, it's the second best book out there to read other than Leadership Behavior DNA. <laughs> I guess I would say, you know, in, in, uh, in the Air Force, what they re evolved to was what was called 360 feedback. And all senior leaders receive feedback annually from their subordinates. So you're going to get feedback whether you like it or not. The only caution I have to all of you out there is you are who you are. Though. And I do think self-awareness is important, but don't go chasing down that bunny trail trying to be all things to all people. You know, you have to make tough decisions. You have to do the right thing. Let right be your guide. And some people are going to judge you because they didn't get what they wanted or it wasn't the outcome they desired. Don't be looking over your shoulder. But if you live by this mantra, treat people with dignity and respect, you'll come out in the long run in a good way. But Hugh, I couldn't agree more. Uh, you really have to want to be able to change and, and to accept that feedback and be willing to be coachable. And again, it gets harder because you become insulated the higher you move up. So thanks for sharing those thoughts with me. Yes, sir. Thank you. And the, uh, I wanted to say a couple of things and we're going to close out. Ray Ellen's got another uh, webinar she's leading at the top of the hour or going to be part of. And we all have many things to do today. I wanted to 
just mention the word courage, because when you think about being vulnerable, you know, there are people that say, well, I am who I am, and that's just the way I am, and I ain't changing. The reason they're not is two things. One is they don't really focus toward their identity of who they really want to be and, and see that as a motivation. And number two, though, a lot of times it's just plain old courage. They're afraid. They're afraid to actually face the mirror of themselves and say, I really do need to grow. So I'm glad to have that 360 feedback. Ray Ellen and I use that in the corporate world also. So courage is always going to be essential as a leader. If you don't have courage, you will not be able to do the things we've been talking about. And the final thing I wanted to say uh, was uh, this is how I do what you guys were talking about. I do uh, a video replay when I come out of, a, of an engagement with a person or a situation, my situational awareness, I critique it afterwards. I do a video replay. I just say, how did that go? Did I, what did I do well? What could I, just like a debrief in the Air Force, when we go fly, we come back and we debrief. What went well? What could have been done better? Just that same replay, debrief, and what can I learn for next time and coach myself on that for next time? It's not easy. Uh, it's hard, but uh, sometimes it's light, sometimes it's heavy, but I think we all have to learn to do that. And that's how we grow to be better people, but also better leaders. So as we close out today, I want to thank you all again for joining us today. This has been a fabulous uh, day for us to have General Rand and Ray Ellen with us. It's been so wonderful. Thank you all so much for joining us. Kevin reminded me that we have a freebie today, a gift for all of you who have joined us in the webinar, and that is a download of the first four chapters of this new book, Leadership Behavior DNA, Discovering Natural Talents and Managing Differences, which goes into a lot of depth about natural talents. As we look at all of the eight factors, the 16 traits, and which ones, the strengths, the struggles, and how to relate to them very much in depth. So you can download that for free, but you will have to go. We won't send it automatically. You'll have to go to the link that Kevin's going to post to do that. Again, thank you, Joe Rand. Thank you, Ray Allen. And Kevin is bringing that up now so you can see where to get to that. And as we close out, uh, Kevin, do we have time or do we want to take any questions or is that it? Uh, we can take one question if you'd like. Um, there one question, are some, okay. Yeah, there are some being posted here. Uh, the question that we had earlier uh, was about, uh, do you have any advice for a leader who lacks confidence in their own abilities as a leader? This is from Leonard uh, Gasberry. And he says, my biggest struggle is feeling like I'm not good enough or smart enough, um, but I have to lead. Well, I have one comment and then I'll let General Rand sum it up. But I know that we all have lies that we believe about ourselves. And what we have to learn to do is to believe the people who believe in us and who tell us things about ourselves that we kind of doubt. And this has been a lifelong process for me. And that's why people who've been mentors or friends who've spoken into my life, who've helped me to get free from lives that were holding me back. And so people like General Rand, has, General Rand has been giving me freedom from those lies over the last eight years as he's told me what a, what a good guy I am and things that I've done well <laughs> that he appreciates in my book or whatever. And that's, that's empowered me to step out stronger. So I think you just have to undo yourself, unhitch yourself, break free from the shackles of the lies that are holding you back because you probably have a whole lot more potential than you think you do if you're worried about that. General Rand? Well, was that Leonard who asked that? Yes. My comment to Leonard would be, you're a leader I wanna follow. I, I can sense that question, you have great humility in that you feel that way, you're very coachable and teachable. And I'd rather, I'd rather follow someone like that than someone who thinks they have all the answers and know what they're doing. So you're not giving yourself enough credit and I'd happily talk to you I could give you a long list of my failures through the 40 years that I served in the Air Force. The failures far exceed my accomplishments, okay? And you keep your attitude, you're probably a lot better than you think. So hang in there, my friend. Yeah, I was going to back up, I think back up that comment uh, from General Rand in a different way. But um, Leonard, I, I, I would just keep yourself in the place of asking your team questions and, uh, they, they will go and work out the answers. You don't have to be the, uh, the smartest or the sharpest tool in the shed on, on, on every issue, but you can hold your power 
which will give you the confidence by asking questions in, 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 in a nice but incisive way. They'll come back with the answers. Everybody will feel empowered. And uh, I think as Ray Allen was saying before, you've included everybody then to make the, to make the decision. And, and uh, you'll find that you, you will, you'll have a lot of confidence from that. I, th I think that's a great way to wind it up today. This has been uh, such a wonderful session. I'm just thrilled with the insights. And, uh, you know, this is, a, this is like a pot of gold. You guys, uh, Ray Allen and General Rand, you brought us a pot of gold today, and we're going <laughs> to give it away for free. And I'm sitting here thinking, man, this is this is the way we make our living, and we're just giving it all away for free. And I'm so happy to be able to do that it, because I love to help people grow and develop. That's my mission in life. That's what I'm about. And I know Ray Ellen and Hugh are that way too, and 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 General Rand, and we all are that way. So we're happy to give that. And uh, there's just so much wisdom here, Kevin. I'll let you wrap it up. Yeah, thank you so much, audience, for attending today. You will receive an on-demand recording of this event that you can share with as many people as you wish. So thank you again, and thank you for spending time with us. Thank you, guests, for attending with us today. We appreciate it so much. Everyone have a great day. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. Thank you, everyone. I enjoyed this very thank much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, sir.